So as you enter the cave, uh, you find that it is quite dimly lit, although all three of you have dark vision. So you're able to see, let's see. I have dark vision. I, I do as well. So uh, <laughs> go ahead and uh, just roll collectively a perception check. You have dark vision, but I want to see how much you see. Oh, that's cocked. What do your orcish eyes see? Mine see a 14 worth of. 14? I rolled 11. 14. 14. So I'll say the two with you with the 14. Uh, you see in the back corner this owlbear. The owlbear is slightly different than the ones you're used to. This owlbear is glowing with a light teal aura. And it is surrounding this owlbear, and you see it sort of starting to stand and motion and makes eye contact with you as you enter the cave. And you just hear <clears throat> On that, Ardaloth, you're up first. Okay, uh, so with a, f let's see, let's count out from where I am. Okay, yeah, I can reach that. Is it possible for me to go directly here? Can I clear this water? Uh, let's see. I have 50 feet of movement. 50 feet of movement. <laughs> let's treat the water as, it's a little deep, so I'd say this required just a, a fun little either athletics or acrobatics check, your choice, just to see if you can clear over it. Okay, let's see. We like, uh, we like athletics. 13. 13. You so, drown. <laughs> <laughs> Seems fair. So what's your intent? Are you trying to like run and jump? Attack? I was trying to run and jump and get across. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to say this succeeds. Okay. So you just take off at a leap and right against the edge of this water, you can actually kind of see as you're jumping over, this thing is deep. So it's probably a good thing you didn't fall into it. We love um, to see it. But you can see it, and you make it over to the other side, you would be now in melee okay. of the Albert. All right, let's see. Um, we're gonna try for just a unarmed strike and see where that, get, where that takes me. All right. Thirteen. Thirteen. So as you make this leap, you go in with your fist in the air and you punch down and you manage to hit right along the shoulder of the Albear. Roll damage. Okay, let's nice. see. Nice. I love nice, to see nice, it. Nice, nice. First blood. First blood. Oh, of course, it's a one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's four points of bludgeoning. Four points of bludgeoning damage. Uh, so when you make contact with the shoulder, the Albear is still getting up. Mm -hmm. So you hit the shoulder that's more on this side and you just punch down where you can see the elbow joint just kind of like buckle a bit. So it's like Okay. But it definitely notices you're here now, that's for sure. That was well, that your warning out. shot. There yeah. you go. So I'm gonna spend a key point. Okay, go ahead. I'm gonna try and hit it two more times with flurry of blows. All right. So 18. Hits. And 11. <laughs> that misses, I'm afraid. I had a feeling, I had a feeling that that one was, but the one that did hit is gonna be six more points of bludgeoning damage. Six more points of damage, perfect. So, as you decide to say, mm -mm, no, we're not just doing one strike. You go with the other arm for a shoulder hit right to try and hit it back up, and you do, mm -hmm. to where this owlbear is now punched down and punched back up right where you can almost hear like a little Ooh. Nice. Popped his shoulder it, back in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know whether you realigned or disaligned the chakra, well, but we're going to find out. We're going to find out. So, you, did you take one level in chiropractic? Apparently, I did. Clearly, right? So, oh, I've been needing that pop for so long. Yeah. What happens here is you find yourself doing this one last blow. You're kind of wanting to hit a little bit closer to the side, but this one, when you realign, it just barely misses. Anything else? Because he popped into place, so that's what that is. I think, um, I think that's it for me for this turn. Cool, uh, Sven, go ahead. 
All righty. So I look over and I see this kind of ra like raised elevation area to yeah, the Yeah, it's, right. it's about five feet in the front of it and 10 feet in the, in the rear of it. In the rear. Yeah. Okay, well I see that and even five feet is too much for me to climb. So I'm gonna go ahead and misty step. Okay. That's my bonus action. Excellent. So, so 30 feet. That'll be one, two, three, four, five. There we go. That's good for there. Yep, that's 25 feet, so we have five feet left. Okay. I'm good right there as long as I'm in high elevation. Yes. Um, and then I look over and as, uh, as my action, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna go ahead and take, uh, just do my cantrip since I've already cast a spell. Okay. I'm gonna do frostbite onto the owlbear. All right, let me check something here real quick. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I will say that Arloth is slightly in the way, so that will affect this ever so slightly. Okay. But in general, you should have, because you placed yourself right here, yeah. if that's yeah. correct. Yes. Can so I, it affects it a little bit, just don't nat one, you're fine. Alrighty. <laughs> no I can take no it, you're fine. No pressure. So when I misty stepped, I actually uh, kind of disappeared into the ground and reappeared oh. into the space that I wanted to be. Terrifying. I yeah. love it. Awesome. <laughs> um, and then, but this one, it doesn't require a spell attack. It actually requires a constitution saving throw. Yes, that is correct. And I'll go ahead and tell you that I went and rolled for the owlbear and uh, yeah, that did not end well. The owlbear is not gonna know what's coming, didn't even see you hit the step mm -hmm. and is not gonna see the spell coming. Okay. Fail, failed miserably. All right, awesome. So that is 2d6 damage. Okay. Uh, seven points of cold damage to the owlbear. And he, he now has disadvantage on his next weapon attack. So. Okay. So seven damage, hold please. Mm -hmm. So as I cast the frostbite, the frost kind of takes over the owlbear and just kind of slows his movements in general, making it harder for him to attack. So as this frost hits, you see little icicles spread around. The icicles continue to spread and add to the aura. Okay. It almost like emphasizes this Ooh. aura and it glows slightly brighter. You can tell that it kind of hurt, mm -hmm. but I don't think it did exactly what you intended. Oh, okay. Uh, well, Anything that else? terrifies me to seeing it kind of take on that form. Um, and that, that's all I can do on my turn. From a front row seat perspective, does it look like it added anything or would I be able to tell? I'll say go ahead and make an arcana check. Oh great, I'm good at that. <laughs> I jinxed myself, it's an 18, Ooh. actually, just kidding. <laughs> uh, so you do notice that there is some sort of effect and you almost hear this little boom. Oh, I don't like that. <laughs> and I don't like that. <laughs> all right, anything else with your turns, Ben? Oh no, that's all for my turn. Cool, Nika, go ahead. Cool, so we've done some chiropractics, we've done some uh, cryo, yeah, cryotherapy, cryotherapy. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna hit it with my battle axe. So okay. uh, my orcish self is gonna do the most and use one of my um, adrenaline rushes to dash as a bonus action. Ooh. Okay. It also adds three temporary hit points because again, orcs, they're doing the most. And so that's gonna get me five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55. And I kind of like, as I'm pulling my great ax, I had watched our monk jump over the water and I'm like, uh, show off, kind of whisper to myself and run around. <laughs> uh -huh. um, let's see, since I still have some movement to flank what I need to get exactly on the opposite side. No, I'd say like right here is yeah. enough of a flanking. So instead of going that straight, I'll go diagonal. Okay, that's fine. Set up a flank. Um, couldn't care less about whatever arcana stuff is going on. Mm -hmm. I do kind of like feel bad for chopping into this thing because the teal kind of matches my <laughs> orcish teal hair. Um, you know, so there's a little bit of a kinship here, but uh, not sad enough not to hit it with this great axe. Perfect for the kinslayer. Okay, so with advantage flanking, glad I took it. Uh, that's gonna be 18 to hit. Hits. Dope. 
We love to see it. I re-roll twos, and that turns into a nine plus three, so 12 points of damage as I just slice down just with a roar. Arrgh! So as you slice down, you're like, mm, one shoulder's already occupied. Let's go for the other shoulder. <laughs> so as you hit into the shoulder, you make a nice little fissure. Ooh. And as this fissure, you hear a crink, 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 crink. It makes a significant crack in this albert and you see this glowing aspect so i need you to make a constitution saving throw please okay sure uh constitution that's a 10 straight a 10 straight uh so you feel this burst from the fissure and it hits like right on your hip ah. and you're going to take four points of cold damage as the icicles slowly spread onto your hip not cool. Oh, but I it mean, is. but it is cool. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else with your turn? Uh, let's see. Bonus, move, action. Oh, I get to make two attacks because I'm level five. Go ahead. Right. Hopefully, I don't do as much damage this time, I guess. The ice makes it extra cool. Ooh. Okay. And with advantage with the flank, I do a 19 to hit with also the great axe again. Nice. So I'm like, that shoulder is weird. <laughs> so I'm gonna go for like the hindquarters. <laughs> and let's see what I get. Ooh, I do more damage. 13. <laughs> 13. So as you do the secondary slash, you go for the shoulder first, you feel the ah on your hip, yeah. and you're like, mm-mm. And you slash through. And it's gonna be, again, how many points of damage? Uh, 13. 13. 13 points of damage. Big damage. Yes. Anything else with your turn? Uh, that will be all, and that was slashing damage. All right, need something here real quick. I don't like that. More fun. So, yeah. Uh. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to I make, had a feeling. Just wanted to make sure. It's getting a little toasty in here. I need to cool down, I think. Ooh. <laughs> I mean, I agree so I'm gonna go ahead and say that. Fired. <laughs> you're gonna need to both make constitution saving throws. Oh, great. Front row. We're in the splash zone. You Vicky. really are. I'm sorry. Constitution again? Mm-hmm. Six. Nine. <laughs> <laughs> All <bad>. right. Almost <laughs> twins. Almost. Almost twins. I just Let me math it. this out. All three of you hear a voice in your head. What? You come into my cave. Uh oh. The owlbear rolled a natural 20. <laughs> oh, ouch. So you hear that little whirring noise. Uh -huh. You see the beak slowly open. And I'll say you see this with an even passive perception. You see there is a moat of something and it is glowing brightly. You could see it in the fissure. Now you can see it full hmm. bore as you both get whacked for 26 points Holy of cold hunk. damage. Ouch. I caramba. <laughs> that doesn't look good. It's just like it's <laughs> blowing my hair back. I'm <laughs> like my cheeks are flapping. <laughs> you then hear the voice again. Too slow. And then you see it blip. No. no. I'll give you both an opportunity attack. Oh, okay, I'll take that. If with this Sentinel, is going to be a little harder because this is a very sudden movement. Is it still advantage with flanking? No, this is going to be a straight. Okay. Okay. Nine. Nine. Plus, well, no, miss. plus six, so oh. fifteen. Fifteen. That's going to miss. That's an eight. An eight. So this owlbear suddenly, oh. after dealing cold damage to you all blips i look over to arloth and i'm like magic bear magic bear <laughs> magic bear <laughs> this, does, this doesn't look good <laughs> and i'll go ahead and tell you that you are now out of initiative count okay give oh, me a that. group perception check great 12 12 16. 16. 
Nine. You're the only one that sees this because you have the high ground. Mm -hmm. You see when it blips, you see the moat actually stays mm -hmm. for an infinitesimal moment longer. Mm -hmm. And you see what appears to be a butterfly. Okay. As it, and it stays for a moment longer. All right. Does it feel like it, so it feels like the presence is still there. Do I think it's gonna come back? With I, I would say no. Okay. You, you definitely see it blip fully out. Okay. I am gonna quickly use my divine sense to see if this thing is celestial, fiend, or undead. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And it well, just happens. It just happens, no, yeah. don't need any roll. No cool. roll. Uh, within 60 feet and not behind total cover. Oh, it's definitely Celestial. What? Ooh. Nix that. It is Angel Bear. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is a very short introduction to D&D. &D. Today on Let's Play Games, we're going to get into the most famous role-playing game in tabletop version. All of this will make sense once we get through. And this time, as you can tell, I have help. <laughs> Let's get stuck in. Welcome back. What we're going to have here is, in this episode, we're going to talk about what we would call a session zero. This would be before any sort of play takes place. You've decided you want to play, but first, you need characters. So we're going to go through this step by step. Today, I have with me three of my lovely coworkers. If you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves. Hello, I'm Andrew Palmer, he, him, they, them pronouns. I work here at the main library in the teen department, running D&D programs, uh, gaming and video gaming, and all sorts of fun stuff. So, um, super happy that I got invited to be here, and I'll be playing Nika, the kin killer. Okay, um, I'm Vicki Fritz. I am the teen associate at Thompson Lane's library branch, um, and I go by she, they pronouns. And the character that I intend to create is going to be called Artaloth St. George. Uh, I'm Chase Caudell. I work here in the adult services at the main library. Uh, I maintain the board game collection here at the main library, and uh, excited to be here. Thank you for the invite, John. Uh, today I'm going to be playing a wizard uh, named uh, Sven Arthburn. Scooch this just so everybody can see. So uh, first, we've already created some characters, but these characters are representative of three different types of characters you can play. There's a myriad of options, but we simplified it into a couple ease of use characters. A very heavy melee damage dealer, a monk who can be sometimes the best of both worlds, and a wizard, a magic dealer. We love it. So in any character creation, you first want to think about what type of character you want to play. So Andrew, why did you decide to play Nika? So Nika is a paladin. A paladin is uh, to use that same phrase, kind of get the best of both worlds, you can do some heavy martial. Uh, you have proficiency, which means you're used to using like heavier armor, bigger weapons, two-handed weapons. So you're gonna be dealing a lot of damage with those. Uh, but with the Paladin class comes a few uh, healing abilities and something called Smite later down the line, which just makes you do more damage. Um, so kind of wanted to be a character that's up front, in the action, in the splash zone, 
if you will, and but also able to um, stay up with the healing abilities and not go f full frenzy mode like a barbarian or, or a fighter, um, but have a lot of those fighter type abilities. Now you also decided to play orc. I did. What went into that? So I'm familiar-ish with the um, with the Fandelver um, adventure, and I know that part of it is going to be um, searching out these orc uh, uh, bands of orcs, and in this area, um, Nika isn't cool with the orcs uh, just killing people um, for the fun of it, and these raiding bands kind of preying on. Uh, innocent villages and such. So I decided to play a character with a little bit of nuance, a connection to the baddies mm -hmm. that will add more role play value and you know give emotion to a character that has been emotionless for most of her life. Um, and the orc race to play has a lot of cool components to it, such as um, I think it's called, let's see, Relentless Endurance, which means when I go to zero hit points, you normally just are unconscious and roll death saves. Mm -hmm. uh, but instead of that, I will pop back up with one hit point and give me another chance to either heal or do some damage before going down again. Uh, there's a few other aspects as to why I chose Orc, but um, we'll get into that in the character creation. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Ardalas, tell me about yours. You're a tiefling monk. Tiefling monk. Um, partially, I picked tiefling because I wanted access to some of the spells that would come along with that because um, they inherently have certain cantrips that they get access to. Mm -hmm. um, I was also interested in, selfishly, I wanted to be purple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm allowed to look choice. cool. I'm That's... purple too. Oh, we match. are twins. We are twins. Yes. <laughs> now, for purposes of explanation, can you explain a cantrip? Okay, Ooh. so a cantrip is kind of like a, uh, most of the spells, when you use them, you have a certain number at a certain level that you can use. A cantrip mm. is kind of a freebie. It doesn't really cost, it doesn't do as much, but it also doesn't cost as much. So, um, for example, I would have access to, goodness, I don't remember which one that you get first. Uh -huh. It's like a low effort spell. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's, when you're sleepy. Yeah, yeah. something you can do at will. Yeah. Low energy. Heat up your coffee. Right? <laughs> it also <laughs> helps if you've run out of spell slots. Yes. That's true. As a caster of any sort, spell slots are sort of like your font of energy that you have to use. So you've got different options. What about your uh, character background? So I leaned into making a, uh, a noble that has changed skins essentially and wants to become a little bit more in tune with uh, finding balance in the elements and mm -hmm. seeing the world from a different perspective. They're kind of tired of the nobility aspect. Um, so a lord who wants to play it being a common folk mm -hmm. and I is going it. to go through the monastery to accomplish that. That's perfect. Now. Sven. So Sven, Sven Arthburn. So I chose uh, Sven because, um, like, as a wizard, I, you're able to kind of control the battlefield in a way um, from a distance. <laughs> uh, <laughs> definitely from a distance. I'm not going to be your upfront fighter. Um, I'm focusing more into defensive spells, um, things like mage armor and shield uh, and uh, counter spell, things like that to really help me control situations so that I can um, let my teammates do most of the damage <laughs> while hey, I keep them protected. Good. You want to live to tell the tale. Exactly. Which is fair. We need at least one of those in the party yeah. since we're both right up there. Run away. Living to tell the tale is very important to Sven because his whole goal here in Fandelver um, is to um, pursue his academic studies. Uh, he's a very studious type, like coming up through the academy um, and He's currently on an expedition to um, research the different um, magical infusions from the gems, uh, gemstones Ooh. and stuff from the Fandelver region. So. so you're a nerd playing a nerd. It, basically, yes. <laughs> playing the nerd Play class. what you know. <laughs> <laughs> My first character was a socially awkward wizard tiefling. It works. <laughs> it works. 
But notice that there's so many different ways and types to create characters and archetypes and backstories. You notice I'm behind a screen. I'm playing as the DM or the GM in some definitions, depending on what type of game you play. My job here is to help with the character creation process, to help with the story. Yes, your job is to absolutely survive, but mine is to create the narrative around which there is tension and action. And we'll have some asides going into the DM process, so if you're curious about DMing, don't worry, there's plenty here for you too. So let's go into how you created your characters. Obviously, we've already rolled them to high heaven, but there's a couple different ways that you can build these characters in the first place. Everything in this game is resolved through dice rolls. And there's a little set of dice that you can usually get, but the most important here is gonna be the D20, a 20-sided die. We all use it a lot. This is what determines your actions both in combat and in exploration. You heard earlier there was a mix of investigation checks to see your surroundings, an athletics check to clear a boundary or make a leap of action. And there's a number that you usually have to clear, which is decided by the DM. So you rolled, what was it, a 13 on the athletics? 14. 14 on the athletics. So jumping over, I had it as a, an easy DC or difficulty class. All you needed to clear was 10. Anything beyond a 10, you're getting there. If you rolled a nine, there would have been some outcome or action, which can be you fall into the water or you take a little bit of damage or you fall into the water, take a little bit of damage and your prize hurt. <laughs> this is part of the game. And as you get to higher levels, uh, you heard Andrew say, that they were playing level five characters. As you start getting higher level characters, things get more dangerous, interesting, a bit spicy. But as you created your characters, we're going all the way back to level one. We're starting from simplistic level. So there are kind of two major ways that I guess we need to talk about of how you built your characters. Mm -hmm. So first off, let's talk about the actual rolling and then we can talk about another way to do it. Okay, um, so I've seen a couple of different ways to do this. Um, preferred method when I play with my, my friends and I am DM is I normally roll with five D6 and you take the three highest. But I've seen people do it with just three mm -hmm. and then you just roll, you get what you roll. Mm -hmm. And typically it all, in the book it usually suggests four D6 and mm -hmm. take away the worst and also as a DM, you can have some rules for the interest of your players. For example, it I don't think has it in here specifically, but I always have, if you roll a one, re-roll the one, mm -hmm. just because you don't want your characters to be permanently throughout the game handicapped, disadvantaged by having some sort of, if you roll really, really badly, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you've got a better shot. And also, it allows me to throw more fun things your way. <laughs> so when you did that with your rolls, um, mm -hmm. did you roll by individual ability score, or did you roll and then allocate? I roll and then allocate. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So we've got the various ability scores, and they go into a couple of different classes. Strength, which is your... Ability to lift, ability to move, ability to jump. Dexterity, your ability to dodge, your ability to get out of the way or do some sort of fancy high wire acrobatics. Constitution, which is your ability to withstand and retain and hold together as Nika found out. <laughs> Sometimes it's a little hard to <clears throat> hold back the uh, inevitable burst of ice that comes your way. Yeah. Intelligence, your book smarts, your ability to make determinations as to processing material you've researched and read, this is integral to a wizard. So if you're playing as a wizard, you're gonna want to use that highest stat that you roll, that's going into intelligence. Mm -hmm. Also Wiz used a lot for spell casting. Mm -hmm. Yes. And learning spells. Exactly. Correct. Wizard. Yeah. Wisdom. I more like talking about it as street smarts, but it can be in a variety of ways. It's your ability to 
understand the world around you and how you are able to process things about the world. This is common with druids, usually have that high wisdom score. And then almost everyone's favorite, charisma. <laughs> how well can you talk? How well can you convince someone, especially someone who may not be interested in talking with you? These six different stats can be allocated into the character in a particular way. So when you did your roll, mm -hmm. go ahead and tell me what the ability scores you picked, like go kind of in order. From like highest to lowest? Yes. Okay, um, so I have strength and intelligence as my two highest. Uh, they're both 16s. Um, and then con and dex are 15s. Charisma is 12, and my wisdom is a seven. Wisdom being a seven. So let's Oof. talk about modifiers real quick. Okay. So what does a seven mean in terms of how it affects your rolls? Okay, so with a seven, you would roll a d20, and then uh, you'd actually have to take two away from the total that you get. So it's a minus two modifier. Right, compared to your highest stat, which was 16? 16. So what would that modifier be? A plus three. Plus three. Nice. So every step up in two points, yes, this is math, apologies, <laughs> it affects how you are able to interact. If you have a plus three, mm -hmm. you're going to be able to interact with the world better based on these stats. And it also means that when we get to actual role play, it affects how you interact with things. So the two of you took a completely different method. Right, yeah. Uh, we both chose point by, which mm -hmm. is another system explained in the player's handbook as a way to allocate stats. Uh, with point by, you really start, every stat is, equal, is, is set to eight at the beginning. It can go no lower than eight, um, but then you have a certain amount of points to buy or allocate uh, to each of the stats up to a certain level. The maximum you can take a stat and point by is 15 uh, before any additional modifiers that you get in character creation. Um, so for me, for example, um, my most important stat as a wizard was intelligence. It's my spellcasting modifier as well as my ability to study and research and kind of um, investigate my surroundings uh, or understand the arcane. So I took my intelligence all the way to 15, um, is the highest I could, which gave me a plus two modifier on that stat. And then I was able to add an additional um, bonus due to me being an Earth Genasi. Uh, I was able to add a plus one to that to take it to a 16, right. which bumped it from a plus two to a plus three overall. Correct. So with these stats, let's take a look at our respective character sheets. And let me put this out here so we can have a little bit easier to look at. This is a blank one. So the important thing here is we're going to ignore here, 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 all of this. We're just going to focus on these right here. So all of these numbers that we've talked about, we would respectively write in. Do you mind if I huh? use Absolutely. Your... Perfect. Thank you. So notice it's blank here. So we're just going to scooch this one in. The points were allocated, so we talked about the 16, the 14, the 8. That had a minus 1. This goes into our skill sets. So with these stats at a baseline, we'll get to the other part here in a moment. Talk a bit about the skills. So I noticed that you were able to, and you'd be able to with creating a character too, have proficiencies, things you're especially good at. So talk about the skills that you have, for example, religion you mm -hmm. have proficient in. How does that go into your character? So as a, the studious type from the, the academy, I study a lot of like uh, local lores and things like that and study the cultures of the people of whatever region I'm, I'm particularly interested in, in this case, Vandelver. Um, so I, would, um, I took proficiency in religion so that I would have familiarity uh, whenever I make any of those checks outside of combat. Say we find a text in, uh, uh, in one of the stores there in uh, Phandalin, I can uh, look at it and kind of better understand um, based on my knowledge of the local surrounding. Right. So then we also have these saving throws here. <laughs> Uh, why is intelligence and wisdom higher than the others here? So intelligence and wisdom are higher than the others because that is a feature of the wizard class. 
um, intelligence and wisdom, you gain proficiency in, the, proficiency in those automatically just by being a wizard. Um, and the stats are higher because I add my proficiency bonus to, uh, to my natural stat uh, modifying points here. Uh, proficiency bonus is a blanket bonus that everyone gets, and at level one, it's plus two. So I take my stat plus the plus two, it puts my intelligence wisdom saving throw to a plus five. Right, and a lot of these initial stats go into how your character is. Because once you've decided, okay, it's a really intelligent character, it's a really wise character as well, and that feeds into how you're gonna play the character, how you're going to be able to interact with the world around you. So how did that go into your personality traits, ideals, bonds, flaws? Because you can roll these on a simple chart that's usually provided with character creation, or you can come up with your own depending on what kind of character you wanna play. Yes, yeah, so um, I went, uh, as I've mentioned before, I went the studious route as the uh, academic wizard. Um, and those flaw uh, uh, bonds and flaws and things like that, I'm, uh, my pursuit for knowledge in whatever film that I'm or, or uh, field that I'm currently studying, um, I'm very single-minded and my focus whenever it comes to that. So I'm always looking out for anything that will uh, uh, continue that gaining gaining the knowledge of whatever I'm interested in. So I'm not uh, if something is dangerous. I don't really care if it's dangerous because there might be something that I need to know over there. <laughs> so right. So I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep going no matter if it's in the pursuit of knowledge. I'm gonna keep going. So with this, you've heard numerous different ways to create a character, to experience the world around you. You heard so much about combat and what we're doing when we're actually in some sort of engagement. Let me take a step back. More on that in a moment because now we're gonna add some equipment to your characters. Mm -hmm. One second. We've created our characters. We've created our character archetypes, what we want to play, how we want to play. Now we've got to give you stuff to do. <laughs> One of the things you'll find out is there is a currency system within D&D, and they can be in different piece types. Silver pieces, gold pieces, platinum pieces. There are five different steps, and over the course of adventure, you're going to get more gold pieces or things that can be sold for gold pieces to increase what you can do with your character. But you start off, uh, when you all did your starting wealth, did you roll for it or did you take like an even baseline? I had to take an even baseline because okay. I'm with a noble background. Yes. Uh, what about you two? So I did the equipment, uh, uh, just acquiring the equipment through character creation, so I got the baseline from my background of us as a sage. What did yep. you do? Baseline as well um, okay. with the starting equipment. Now, I'm going to use you as the example here mm -hmm. uh, in your paladin. On here, it specifically says 5d4. So it's these little triangle die right here. The devil dies. Terrible to step on. Yes. Terrible to step on. Worse Please avoid if you can. Basically, caltrops. So it would be <laughs> 5d4. And then do you mind if I roll these real quick? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. So we're going to take all of these. And we've got three, six, Seven, four, so 11. Oh no, catastrophe. <laughs> so I'll add one gold to my character sheet. <laughs> there you go. Hey. So that would be. <laughs> That's one gold. That one's yours, right? Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, these three. All right. So that would mean that you would have times 10, 110 gold pieces. Ooh. I'll add a lot more. <laughs> the Indie Beyond only gave me 10 gold pieces. That's before purchasing equipment, though. Right. Oh, That's yeah, right. you, touche. You get 10 gold pieces touche. by default and out of mercy. <laughs> so first, let's talk about this little shield thing right here. We've got the armor class. So the armor class is, uh, you heard during that combat segment, about what hit versus what didn't. When they made the attacks that they made, we were rolling against their armor class 
trying to see if we hit the other person. So that owlbear from that segment, it has an armor class of 13. So when you make your roll, you make your attack, there will be a modifier, which we'll get to in a moment, and it equaled a certain amount. Some of you hit it. You hit it twice and missed once because you did not meet that armor class. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is meet it or exceed it. Exceeding it is always nice. Mm -hmm. But that is your capacity to take a hit. That's why on that third attack, I just described it missing. That is another role of the DM is using what materials we have with the characters to describe what happens to them. So for example, if you're wearing really heavy male plate armor and you take a really bad hit, you'll experience a crack in that armor. So it will be part of the description and action. So for you all, uh, I notice your armor class is a 12. Yes, well, I'm not really a frontline fighter, so. Uh, and that, I got to that 12 just from the baseline of 10, mm -hmm. plus my dexterity, because I'm not wearing any armor. Why are you not wearing any armor? Because as a wizard, I don't have any proficiency in armor. <laughs> and that is some of the choices that you can make. What would have happened had you donned some armor? So, for example, if I, uh, invested in some like light leather armor, mm -hmm. it would have given me a plus one modifier to that armor class. I would have been at a 13 instead of a 12. Right. And some you can have, uh, will have uh, what we're gonna call advantage and disadvantage. It can affect your modifier. So one of the things that you have disadvantage on is plate. We'll use, keep that as an example. One of the things you're trying to do within this game is sometimes be sneaky and covert. Now imagine for a moment you are wearing a heavy piece of metal. Usually, if you've ever seen like a knight in the Middle Ages, they clank and crinkle and make all sorts of noise. So if I asked for a group stealth roll. It's chain mail, okay? <laughs> okay? So it's a little bit more fluid, but it's still very noisy. Still, still disadvantage, <laughs> a little jingly. I'm like, yeah, I'm like Gimli when he puts on that chain shirt and yeah. it just goes all the way down. It's a yeah. clink sound. <laughs> So if I called for a group stealth roll as a part of the action, everybody would roll, except you would roll two dice and, and take, take the them. lower number. So if you roll an 18 and a two, you gotta take the two. Compared to, we talked about flanking. We'll get to combat, don't worry. But with that flanking, you had the ability to take advantage. Mm -hmm. With that advantage, you were able to take the higher number right. and use that to your advantage. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you also have a really low AC. I do. Why it's, is that? Is it 12? Um, partially because I think, from my personal experience, it's more interesting to build a character that has a detriment. Um, and I took the negative two in wisdom. And part of a monk's ability in unarmored defense is you get to put your dex and your uh, wisdom into creating the AC number. And mm -hmm. since I have a plus two and a minus two, I got zero. <laughs> <laughs> and you noticed in that combat segment, we talked about a flurry of blows. So mm -hmm. we're trying to move as fast as possible. Part of armor class is not just what you're wearing, it's your ability to dodge. Hence why if I miss you on an attack, I will describe it as you bobbing out of the way like mm -hmm. a boxer rather than it being something that hits you and bops off, especially if it's some sort of magical effect. Right. Now you've got 16 AC. <laughs> With zero dexterity. So. With zero dexterity, <laughs> which is rather impressive. So go into why that's 16. Yeah, so Nika, as a paladin, is trained in heavier armor. So. <clears throat> so that means I can choose from the big clunky mess that is like chainmail, plate armor, all those. I wanted to be the upfront, what some people call a tank, if you're familiar with like MMOs and stuff, uh, which means that I'm not necessarily, you know, weaving out of the way of things. I'm more letting my armor take the blunt of the attacks mm -hmm. and trusting that it will. Um, stop whatever blade or punch is coming at me. 
So from there, now we've got our audience. <coughs> we've got it figured out. So we can move on to attacks and spell casting. So let's go into weapons and why certain things are happening the way they are. Uh, Nika, I'll start back with you because you've got some uh, lovely weapon choices. Go into that a bit. Absolutely. So um, along with my heavy chain mail, which I should mention requires you to have a strength of at least 13. So you have to be swole before you can don this armor, mm -hmm. which Nika is swole. She has a 16 in strength. So um, along with that, she has a big two-handed great axe, which just given the weight of the head alone can do some damage, let alone the fact that it is a giant a curved blade um, uh, that is she, she is not chopping wood with. <laughs> Could, but it would be a little overkill. Exactly. So that's going to put me in melee combat with my enemies and deal a lot of damage. Now let's say that there was, like in our scenario, some type of physical barrier, like a, a, a crevice or like a river or something, and I needed to do some distance. Um, fighter types or martial types can choose javelins, and that allows them to add their strength modifier to the attacks, which is what you add to melee attacks, and allows you to do distance damage while adding your strength. Now, we'll talk about ranged a second real quick. Mm -hmm. What would be different about throwing with the javelin if we're using strength for that? How is it normally? Normally, dexterity is used for ranged. You know, you're lining up a shot with your bow and arrow, or you're taking aim with a slingshot or something like this. Uh, with a javelin, because it's thrown, you, you know, you're using those arm muscles. So being swole, Nika is just gonna launch that javelin like a semi-truck going at its uh, enemy. A little fastball right down. Exactly. The Perfect. Uh, now, Artaloth, do you have any ranged weapons? Not yet. Okay. Given time, I will have some ranged attacks. But... And as we're starting at level one for these examples, eventually you'll be able to use that to your advantage. You have a high dex. I do. Which means that later on in play, if ranged attacks use dex, you're going to have at least a keen interest in acquiring something, but it would also be in line with what your character would be okay with using. Right. Um, for example, in the Druid class, usually metal is not something that's dealt with too often. So mm -hmm. if you decide to play a particular class, just kind of read through the general background and that'll help you also make decisions about your character. Because you're probably gonna be a little more okay with using metal type ranged objects, mm -hmm. but it entirely depends on your preference. You could be for example, uh, in your character background, neighboring to a druid commune in the woods that you've interacted with and maybe take on that element as a little flavor for your character. Right. That's why development, it takes a minute, but once you have it, you can use your character as you see fit when I start throwing stuff in the way. Now you are, on the other hand, yes, we got to talk about spell casting. I am a ranged specialist. <laughs> Most <laughs> of my spells are going to affect things far away from me. And if, uh, as opposed to Nika, if, if I ever get into melee, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> 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 but I have taken a few measures to kind of help me with that. Um, I, like I mentioned before, uh, I specialize in shielding and defensive spells. So I, in particular, I have two spells that help me with that, one being Mage Armor, mm -hmm. which will give me a, a base increase to my AC. It'll take me from the 12 that we mentioned before all the way up to a 15 due to magical defense. Mm -hmm. um, I've also taken a spell called Shield, which I can use to uh, temporarily increase my armor class by five for just one round. Um, in doing so, will allow me to dodge any attacks whenever they get close with the hope of the next turn getting far, far away. <laughs> so that then I can use my offensive spells to kind of control the battlefield. Um, there's many options for spell casting. You can specialize into fire spells or ice spells uh, in, or just arcane damage as well. Uh, or even spells that just kind of 
hold people in place or kind of slow their movement or make it harder for them to attack. Um, I've in particular chosen uh, ice and earth as kind of the two uh, elemental spells that I'm able to cast. So I have a lot of ice spells that can freeze people in place, make it harder for them to move, uh, or earth spells that just deal massive bludgeoning damage by throwing big boulders at people <laughs> from, a, from a far distance. Or even disjointing the ground below them. That as well, yes. The last thing we'll talk about is with the remaining gold you have, because everything's gonna cost money, sorry, adventuring gear. Mm -hmm. So these are items and equipment and materials that are helpful. So I want each of you, Sven, I'll start with you, What's the most important piece of adventuring gear that you picked? Uh, well, after my clothing, it's got to be my arcane focus. Okay. What's the arcane focus? So arcane focus allows me to cast the spells that I need to cast mm -hmm. without having to get every little individual component necessary from that the book told me I needed. <laughs> so that is fair. having that on hand, because I, I could have gone two options. I could have gone the arcane focus, which I did. Uh, which takes away all of the components without monetary value to them. Um, or I could have gone component pouch and I could just gather up the, the rat's tail and the eagle's claw and, just <laughs> and have all of those ready for whenever I need to cast my spell. Mm -hmm. So I'd say the arcane focus is that's what I'm able to channel my spells through mm -hmm. and that's my most piece, important piece. Ardalas, what about you? I'd say since I don't actually have spell casting where I need particular components, I'd say um, honestly rope. Rope has saved my life so many times in DC. <laughs> I was like, yes, I will tie everything together and jump across the ledge, and everyone else can follow me. And in the materials, it actually describes how long the rope is. Mm -hmm. So the base that you can get is 50 feet of rope, and it's a hempen rope, which means it can typically hold what we're going to call a medium sized creature. There's different sizes you can be, from small all the way to gargantuan. None of you are gargantuan. My muscles are. Your muscles are swollen, sure they but they're are. not gargantuan. They are part of a medium-sized creature, right? You can throw gargantuan rocks, right? <laughs> yes. And, and that is part of the effect where in some spells it says you can throw a large object or a small object. It will actually specify what you can and can't do. Um, John, my size says massive unit, so. Mm, <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> well, let me check my notes. Nope, sorry, oh, afraid not. That's a custom size. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that's this is part size. of the fun of the game. You're around people where you can laugh, have a good time with it, and also we're gonna do later on role play of the element. And I'm gonna take you through a little bit of a module and a story. This story is one that comes with the starter kit. So it's pretty common and it's not too spoilery. I promise we're not gonna spoil the whole adventure. And I'm going to, as the DM, you heard people talk about their stories, their backgrounds. I'm gonna try and add that in and give particular reasons why these characters would want to go, why these characters would be there, why they're on a small cart on a road to Phandalin. Take another step back and I'm gonna show you how some of these stories get started. One second. Welcome back. We have our character stats. We have our backstory. We have our armor. We have our weapons. And my axe. <laughs> and your adventuring gear, which I look forward to seeing what you have jumbled up in there. You're gonna take advantage of that, and I know it. <laughs> but at this point, we've had our session zero. Usually gameplay does not happen in a session zero because you use the first experience to discuss what kind of game you want to play how you want to play it. You could want to play a hack and slash heavy combat where you're doing adventuring to the extreme and you don't really have to care about your character backgrounds. You could also do heavy, heavy role play. So, for example, Nika, does your character have a particular voice? Yeah, uh, Nika is like a, a northern lass, so I'm taking more of like a Scandinavian type 
uh, accent, which you heard when she was screaming, Magic Bear! Perfect. Artelos, what about you? I do not have an accent, but I do have an elevated speech pattern okay. because of the way I was raised and the classes that I took. Perfect. Sven, what about you? Uh, so I have kind of a mix because Sven is from also a similar region as uh, Nika, but I've also studied at the academy for so long, I've lost m much of my accent. Okay. Um, so very neutral, um, just kind of standard Neverwinter accent. <laughs> so you have posh. <laughs> yeah, basically. But it can still <laughs> crop up in the right moments if you feel that it's right. Exactly, in moments of stress or emotional turmoil, yeah. Or in conversation or, with Nika. Or in conversation or in with conversation Nika. Conversation with just Nika. Back and it just melds other. into the same <laughs> Exactly. <accent. Yeah. laughs> I, as the DM, have to do a variety of accents. Not all of them that great. <laughs> but as the DM, Disclaimer. I am using all of these non-player characters, NPCs, to provide the player characters with things to interact with, things to do, things in the way. Now, we all kind of discussed it a little bit off camera before we got started and use whichever examples you feel comfortable with. We also talk about the way that we interact with the world and things to avoid. We absolutely want to avoid harm to any of our players in both. I try not to kill their characters, well, maybe a little bit, just a little bit, <laughs> but also this is a social game where you're interacting with other people. So treating people with respect and decency is rule number zero. Before anything else, you are playing with friends or you're playing with people who may become friends in the future. We're going to treat them with respect. So, for example, uh, when I play games, I'm very comfortable with role play. I'm very comfortable with interacting with the world. I don't particularly enjoy um, the concept of drowning. I don't particularly enjoy description of drowning. So I would tell my DM this in advance and we would have a discussion as to what type of game we wanted to play. So making sure we're all on the same page before you get started because sometimes I'm incorrect with my own perception and this is the opportunity to have it clarified when I'm preparing for a campaign. This campaign does involve certain things that people might not enjoy. So I take great care to make sure that's excluded. So um, does anyone want to share any particular thing that they don't want to see within this campaign? Uh, I, can, I can share the ones that okay. I spoke about. Yes. Um, for example, uh, I have a pretty severe arachnophobia, um, and it is specifically linked to the way that their legs move. So I would prefer that we don't hear any descriptions of the spider's legs, um, because I will find that particularly triggering. Um, and I also don't like uh, infestation of the body. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that that's a mechanic that comes up relatively often. It does. Um, I don't mind it being used in game, but I prefer that we didn't describe it happening to a character, particularly not mine. And this campaign in particular, it's a shorter campaign, but it does involve spiders, which means that I'm going to have to adjust how I play things slightly for the comfort of characters, even if it means I describe it differently, describe it less. Don't describe it at all and let the other people who are comfortable with it paint that picture in their head. A lot of this is a theater of the mind, unless you actually build sets, which can get somewhat pricey. <laughs> so we have this theater of the mind that we'll use to describe. So if I talk about, ah, the spider dies, you can imagine it how you want. These two can imagine how they want. No one's hurt, we move on with an infestation. You are now, it, your body is now infested. You can just play it super neutral. The two of you can picture it however you want. And you're good, you know the stats. Mm -hmm. Also in general, as a courtesy, if I know that you're gonna be bothered by infestation, mm -hmm. I'm not going to use something that would cause them to be infested. There are things that 
each of these creatures, monsters, non-player characters can do. I'll just do other stuff. <laughs> and you move on and everyone plays happy. This is also where, more often than not, as a DM, do check-ins with your players. If somebody decides, hey, I've kind of reached a character arc and I kind of want to play another character. We could actually sit and discuss if Ardaloth said, hey, I want to try a new character. Let's do something that Ardaloth is taken out. You can either have Ardaloth leave. You can have Ardaloth pass on in some glorious combat. That is a discussion that takes place. So, before we get started into the storyline, is there anything else we want to make sure that we talk about, discuss, make sure we have for everybody's comfort? Yeah, actually mine came about while I was watching an actual play. I learned that I'm not comfortable with descriptions of violence or death uh, to children. Mm -hmm. um, th there was an actual play I was watching and then it happened and I, was, I learned that that is something that I wasn't comfortable with in this game setting. Mm -hmm. So if it's part of a backstory or something, that's fine, but if it's action happening at the table that becomes like real or visceral in its description, I'm not comfortable with that. I don't think we actually talked about that. So, I don't think so either. I just so remembered. It, this is why a session zero is session so zero important. Session zero is very important. Yes. Yes. And it could even be in the middle of session, or you can find out in session five, like, hey, I experienced this, and therefore I don't want to. Yep. Don't want to do that again. Is there anything you oh. want me to exclude? You? Uh, no. Okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. You can have agreements as players. If no one's uncomfortable with anything, you can play it as you see fit. This is not an invitation to make the grotesque campaign of horror. A, there are other games for that. <clears throat> B, this is part of the experience of using either a module, like we're doing here, or what's called a homebrew, adding elements. When we heard that combat, the owlbear doesn't typically deal with cold damage. Mm -hmm. The owlbear is not a celestial. <laughs> that is a creature type. I added that in for a particular reason and something I've used in my other homebrew campaigns. This means I can add a little flavor text and a little fun to it. So work through what you think works for you. As you learn the mechanics of this game, you're gonna find that you can use things in different ways, which are really cool. So I'll just get us started. The module has text that you can just read. And I'm gonna go ahead and do that one here. In the city of Neverwinter, a dwarf named Gundren Rockseeker, G-U-N-D-R-E-N, -E has asked you to bring a wagon load of provisions to the rough and tumble settlement of Phandalin, which is a couple days travel southeast of the city. Gundren was clearly excited and a little more secretive about the reasons for his trip, saying only that he and his brothers had found something big and that he'd pay you 10 gold pieces each for escorting his supplies safely to Barthen's Provisions, a trading post in Phandalin. He then set out ahead of you on horse, along with a warrior escort named Sildar Hallwinter, S-I-L-D-A-R, claiming he needed to arrive early to, as he gruffly described it, mm, take care of some business. <laughs> You've spent the last few days following the high road south from Neverwinter, and you've just recently veered east along the Tribor Trail. You've encountered no trouble so far, but this territory can be dangerous. Bandits and outlaws have been known to lurk across the trail. From here, next episode, we'll actually go into the play of this so you can see how we interact with this world. And don't worry, we'll have plenty of descriptions.